Well, a warm welcome to this talk. It's Wednesday, the 31st of March. Now, today I want to focus on the World Health Organization report that was released yesterday. Uh, we did give a bit of a preview of it the day before, but it was released yesterday. So we want to talk about that today. And, and here is the report. It's uh, downloadable. It's public domain. It's all there. A pretty extensive report, it has to be said. I found it uh, well written. Very detailed report. If I just uh, flick down to the uh, contents here. Clearly, clearly professionally written report, but, but intelligible. Um, and it stretches to, what, 120 pages. So <laughs> it took quite some, uh, quite some wading through. But, but feel free, it's all there. It's in the public domain. But I want to give you the gist of it and um, interesting, th interesting things. Right, so this is the World Health Organization COVID report. Da that's the site to download it. Click on there, you can download it. That's where I got it from. Uh, the, the mission, of course... Uh, a joint international team of 17 Chinese and 17 international experts have compiled this report. So, so that sounds good so far. Uh, they were on the ground in Wuhan, the team from the 14th of January to the 10th of February 2021. This was after a long delay, it has to be said. And even this report itself is delayed and it is quite a lot later than we expected it. So um, everything has been rather slow, really. Uh, they, want to, they wanted to say, sort of the terms of reference of this report, that they want to prevent reinfections in animals and humans. So this is interesting, of course, looking back. Uh, well, it's essential to look back, but the reason we need to know this, the reason this is vital, is we have to be able to prevent the next one and, and stop this becoming endemic. You know, it's vital to know how this started, to know how we go on and how we react with future pandemics. I mean, it's not exaggeration to say many lives depend on uh, the quality of this report for, for the future as well as explaining the past. Uh, they want to prevent establishment of zoo, new zoonotic reservoirs. So in other words, they don't want the virus to take root in mink or cats, for example, which are very prone to catching the virus. Because if there was a zoonotic reservoir, that means an animal reservoir, then the disease could jump from animals from time to time back into humans and this would become endemic and we would probably never get rid of it. So it's, this is a vital, uh, vi vital ongoing importance. It's not just a historical study. Now, a bit on the timeline now. This is interesting. The outbreak may have started sometime in the months before the middle of December 2019. Now, this is based on, on molecular sequencing data. So it may have started... Um, Outbreak may have started sometime in the months before. So they're not ruling out that it started in the months before. So what happened was um, they were able to get genetic sequencing data from um, December and uh, early January. And they looked and they found mutations in, in those viral strains already at that time. And then what you can do is you can estimate the rate of mutation. And from the rate of mutation and the differences in the mutation between two contemporary strains of the virus, you can like compute back and establish a hypothetical timeline into the past. It's called a phylogenetic analysis. So, so that, that's what they've done. And uh, that's what they come up with. So it could be the few months before December 19, based on molecular sequencing data. We do the same thing now with, with humans. I mean, you know, this is well known in genetics. So um, people have studied the mitochondrial DNA, for example, in different humans and worked out the mutation rate. And you can extrapolate that back to one individual woman that we probably um, all uh, have our can trace our descent through. Uh, fascinating. But that's for another day. Um, circulation of SARS coronavirus 2 preceded the initial detection of cases by several weeks. I think that is pretty well established. And this isn't surprising, of course, because. We, we know that when this new, when it, well, we, we know from new virus arriving or, or new variants arising that it starts off very slowly. This is the nature of the exponential rise. And then it goes up all of a sudden. So it wouldn't be surprising if it had been brewing for a period of time. That would be not uh, remotely surprising. Um, virus transmission widespread in Wuhan by the first week of 2020, they've established. So certainly by 2020, it was widespread community spread in the city of Wuhan. Um, epidemic in Wuhan preceded the spread to the rest of the Hubei province. 
So by looking at the timeline when cases were diagnosed, they could see that this was happening first in Wuhan, then it spread out to Hubei. So, so that, that's good information. This outbreak certainly started in Wuhan. Now, there's debate about how it got into Wuhan, but it certainly started in Wuhan and then spread out to Hubei and then to China and other parts of China. And then, of course, as we unfortunately know, all parts of the world. But that was the order. It started in Wuhan City. Um, 174 COVID-19 cases with onset of symptoms in December 2019. Um, so definitely 174 cases there confirmed, diagnosed cases to have confirmed in September 2019. So again, confirming what we know, but, but it, 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 they give a lot of data to support this. So it is, it is worth um, looking at if you're interested. Um, 8th of December, first official diagnosed confirmed case. So... The first time that there's a definite case was the 8th of uh, December 2019, hence the term COVID-19. Uh, 76,000 cases from October and November are unlikely. Now, what they did here was they looked back at medical records and um, they found 76,000 cases which looked like it might be uh, COVID-19. But when they looked at those from October and November, they thought it was unlikely. Now, I think this is probably accurate because even although the cases would be developing in uh, October and November, we believe, they would be starting to go up very, very gradually before the steep increase. Um, to have 76,000 cases would have meant the steep increase had already taken place. So I think that is, um, that is probably accurate. So the re retrospective review of cases probably wasn't showing cases before December, even though there would be some community transmission before then, we believe. So this is the graphic of the, uh, the pandemic. Um, weekly number of influenza-like illness cases. Uh, so basically, um, th this, is the, this is the number of... Uh, so that's, this, is, th this line here is what you'd expect. The dotted line is what there actually was. So there was less cases than you would expect for a while there. And then in week 47, uh, week 48, we get that sudden increase. So, of course, week 48 is uh, four weeks before the end of the year. So that's, um, that's, that's the way the pandemic started in, uh, in Wuhan, that their case is in Wuhan in 2019. So they've drawn up that graph of the start of the, the pandemic. Then, of course, the deaths were delayed. And th this graph is really quite poignant um, comparison of the trends of um, pneumonia mortality rate in 2019 to 2020 versus the average so pneumonia average deaths along the bottom there this sp spike was the actual number so as we would expect because the first cases were in December it was early January when a lot of people started dying of course as we know we typically have this three or four or five week lag from the cases to people starting to dying. So this is completely consistent and it just shot up to very high numbers. But then it came down dramatically as a result of the Chinese lockdown measures. Now, um, this is this is impressive. As, as you know, uh, as we all know, the cases in the United States, the deaths went up and they stayed high. The United Kingdom, they've stayed high. OK, it's been in waves. Europe, still a lot of people are dying. But the, uh, the nature of the restrictive measures taken in China meant that the people stopped dying pretty quickly. So uh, something to learn from China there for a future pandemic that could be way more deadly than this. That uh, dramatic, some might say draconian action in the very early stages of the pandemic saves untold amounts of lives. Let's imagine the Chinese response had been as lacklustre as say the response in Europe or the United States or, or in my country in the UK, then those deaths would have carried on presumably rising and stayed high for a long period of time. But they didn't because of the, the uh, community health measures primarily that the Chinese took. So that is uh, interesting and a lesson for us all from the future because remember the next pandemic could be twice as deadly as SARS coronavirus too. It could be 10 times as deadly. It could be 20 times as deadly. And we need to learn that that dramatic action is necessary in the early stages. I somewhat doubt we have in Western countries, but 
uh, that's what the Chinese did. Now, I get lots of emails saying, well, isn't there lots of the pandemic still raging in China? It's not possible that the Chinese authorities are hiding ongoing massive community transmission. It's just simply not possible. And we've had reports from China that, that shows that there aren't these ongoing cases in China. So we know that the Chinese are able to clobber it quickly. OK, there was delays. There was cover up at the start. We know that. But nevertheless, uh, that, that graph, we believe, is accurate and speaks for itself. Now, going on to the genomics of the virus. Uh, Hunan Market, uh, the, the originally proposed uh, epicentre of the pandemic, Hunan, Hunan Market, at the point of its closing, so when they closed the market, they did 900, the Chinese scientists did 923 environmental samples from that market, and 73 of those were positive mostly contaminated surface. So a uh, very large cluster of positive viral RNA samples discovered in the Wuhan market. So no question there was an outbreak in the Wuhan market. The question is, is did it start there? That's the question, of course. So uh, you can certainly say there was a lot of positive samples. Widespread contamination of surfaces with the SARS coronavirus 2, yes. Hunan market cluster had identical viral genomes. Now, people caught the disease from this market so many different individuals were infected from this market and they went on and infected more individuals and all of these people had the same viral genetics so there is a, um, a what we call a phylogenetic clade a, a descent from that market that caused that cluster but and it's important but other genomes were also discovered from December, January. So there's other outbreaks with different genetics that appear not to come from this market because they have different genetics. So um, not wider different genetics, but different so, so that you can um, infer that there wasn't common descent. So there was other genomes going around. So in other words, the, the, the pandemic was already multi multi-viral genome types there was multiple types of genomes in the same SARS coronavirus too but by December January so it wasn't one simple spread out from the uh, the Hunan market is what that genetic shows us now they did check upstream supplies to the Hunan market taken during 2020 and they found nothing circulating in the animals in other words they looked at places that supply animals to the Wuhan market and they didn't find any uh any evidence of the virus in those according to the data that was analysed. Um, quite detailed this, but it is important to, if you want to understand this, quite important to go through this in some detail really. Uh, initial cases associated with the Hunan market, but cases were associated with other markets and cases were associated not with any markets at all. As we've said, because there were several different genotypes of the virus spreading in December and January. Uh, coronavirus, most highly related to SARS coronavirus 2, found in bats and pangolins. So the closest match, the closest match was coronaviruses found in bats and pangolins. Now, pangolins are these uh, mammals uh, that, with that, 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 they've like got arm, little armor platings on them. Uh, they're endangered because people hunt them for food, unfortunately, so they're endangered. And that they, they were... Um, captured and sold it's appallingly uh, in these markets now we, we, we say we say that and, and these wet markets are despicable places with 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 animal with, with wild animals being caught kept alive and then butchered on site at the point of sale very often um, now it, it, this happens in china but it happens quite a few places in southeast asia as well um you know, quite a few other countries. I'm not, I'm not going to run, run through a list of names of countries, but you, you know which countries are in that region. And these kind of wet markets are a feature of there. And of course, there's problems with bush meat and things from Africa as well. This is not uniquely a Chinese problem, but nevertheless, it's one that should be acted on legally. And of course, the Chinese authorities do have the power to stamp on this uh, illicit trade in wild animals. And uh, I really hope they do so. But again, having said that, the massive monoculture that we have in Western societies for breeding up huge amounts of, uh, of, of animals, because they are so genetically related, there's great 
potential spread for zoonotic transmission from them as well. So basically the whole world needs to rethink its relationship with animals. Uh, Favouring the natural ecosystems on which we depend for our very lives and um, re- yeah, as, as I say rethinking it. This is not I am not pointing fingers at China. I, I get accused of pointing fingers at China and being China phobic and all these things. And then people, and then I get accused of all, all sorts of things. I'm not against anyone. I'm just saying we need to rethink. We need to rethink this. I get accused of being anti-Scottish, anti-Irish, anti-French, anti-German, everything goes with the territory, I'm afraid. But it's not, it's just a genuine scientific opinion that we need to rethink our relationship with animals. But none of the viruses in the bats or pangolin were sufficiently similar to SARS coronavirus 2 to serve as a direct progenitor. So the coronaviruses they found in bats and pangolins were the closest similarity to the ones that caused the, the, the virus that caused the pandemic, but they weren't the direct ancestors of it. So what this means is uh, we, we haven't got to an answer yet. We still don't know. Right, sampling before and after the outbreak. Now, this is interesting. So uh, the Chinese authorities supplied information on widespread sampling before the pandemic and after the pandemic. And the results of that are, are, are interesting. Well, they're good results, really. Basically, before the pandemic, they didn't find any um, SARS coronavirus 2 in domesticated or, um, or wild animals from the survey that they did, meaning that this probably is a genuine novel spillover event from animals. And the other good news is they haven't found any either afterwards. So it looks like so far in China... SARS coronavirus 2 has not become endemic in agricultural or wild animals so far. Of course, you can never know that. You can't prove negatives. But they've they've taken 80,000 wildlife and livestock samples, 31 provinces in China, and they haven't found any. So that is encouraging as far as it goes. Now, the next thing is about cold chains, of course, which the Chinese authorities were keen to talk up. Um, Now, cold chain products were not tested at the time because they hadn't thought of this at the time. Um, but confirmed international transmission in cold chains. In other words, frozen foods can transmit the virus around the world. Um, that, that can happen. Uh, the virus can be frozen and then kind of regenerated when it gets to the other end. But of course, that tells us nothing about what actually did happen. It just tells us it's a possibility. So the four conclusions drawn from this report. Now, the team did say it's a qualitative risk analysis. Qualitative means it's not really based on firm data. So the converse of uh, qualitative is quantitative, which, of course, we'd much rather see. But it's all we've got. So um, we'll put a question mark on it and move on. Right. For, first, direct zoonotic spillover is considered to be a, uh, a possible to likely pathway. OK, well, I think we knew that. Introduction through an intermediate host is considered to be a uh, likely to very likely pathway. OK. But um, whether it was bats or pangolins, we don't really know um, yet. Introduction, well, we know it's probably not bats and pangolins. Well, it, it comes from bats, but probably not via pangolins. But even in bats, they didn't find a direct progenitor virus. So um, whatever those animals were, unclear. Introduction through cold food chains products is considered a possible pathway. That's their third conclusion. Um, but uh, you know the, the idea that this virus didn't arise in China that that is perhaps uh, it, it suggested to intimate is, is, is in my view inaccurate uh, introduction through a labor- laboratory incident was considered to be an extremely unlikely pathway according to the team now I know some of you are now bouncing up and down on your chairs but j- just a minute that, that we're going to get to some interesting bits when we look at the world reaction. Next phase that is not over. Widespread testing of domestic and wild animals, which is, is good, is going to happen. Um, r- r- rhino Rhinolophilus. Rhinolophilus bats, I would say. Rhinolophilus bats, where they think this might be transmitted through. Their, their distribution is uh, southern parts of southern provinces of China, countries around East Asia, Southeast Asia, and many other regions. So that's where they want to be looking. Because these are rhinophilus bats, rhinophilus bats 
they think are the likely origin of the virus, even though they didn't find direct progenitor virus in these, uh, the, 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 these rhinolophilus bats. They're going to do more cold chain analysis and they're going to look at positive results in sewage, serum from blood samples, human or animal tissue swabs and other SARS coronavirus 2 tested at the end of 2019. So we've heard these reports that SARS coronavirus 2 might have been found in sewage systems in Spain at the end of 2019. They're going to check on that and hopefully we'll get some, something definitive. And the World Health Organization team also said they're going to convene a global expert group, which is good. We we'll always want meritocratic experts. Right. Um, lots more links there to check on the, um, the reaction to this. Particularly, particularly, this link here will take you directly to the transcript of the World Health Organization Director General, Dr. Tedros. It will take you directly to his response to this, and it is a little bit surprising, it has to be said. Encouraging as well. Um, anyway, just let's, let's keep going. Now, this group's got together, um, United States, United Kingdom... Australia, Canada, uh, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Israel, Japan. Anyway, you can read it for yourself. Um, quite an interesting, diverse group of countries <clears throat> there. Uh, have all got together and uh, they've written a report, made a statement. Well, a statement rather than a report. So interesting group of countries there have come together to make a common, um, a common response. Um, now, direct quote from their statement, it, uh, it is equally essential that we voice our shared concern, so they're doing it together, which is good, uh, that the international expert study on the source of SARS coronavirus 2 was significantly delayed. So they're unhappy that it was delayed. The team was on the ground about a year late and lacked access to complete original data and samples. So the team lacked access to complete original data and samples. A lot of what the team were going on was information supplied by the Chinese um, half of the uh, team. And they'd been supplied it by other uh, Chinese authorities, one would assume. So that's a direct quote. Uh, while regretting that the late, while regretting the late start of the study, the delayed deployment of the experts and the limited availability of early samples and real data. So they're concerned about that. We consider the work carried out to date, uh, out to date, and the report released today as a helpful first step. So yeah, they're, okay, they're saying it's a helpful first step, but they're regretting lots of uh, problems. Um, that they have identified. European Union also commented, um, called on all relevant authorities to help with the next stage. So they want all relevant authorities. Now, the European Union don't say who they mean by all relevant authorities. So I wonder who they could mean. I mean, I mean why don't they just say so? It's ob so obviously talking about China. Well, you know, it's all wrapped in diplomatic language, but they want all relevant authorities to help, which, of course, we agree with. But you know, it's a bit namby-pamby language, really. Anyway, never mind uh, the diplomats, I suppose. So that any gaps in data needed to further investigations can be addressed. So any gaps in data. So they're clearly implying there's gaps in data. Need further, need to further the investigation and can be addressed called for timely access to independent experts at an early stage in future pandemics. That could result in saving thousands, millions or billions of lives. Access to China after months of fraught negotiations. So they did notice that fraught negotiations were needed even to get to that stage. So a very diplomatic expression of displeasure is how I would read that. Um, the White House um, has weighed in, urged the World Health Organization to take additional steps. Uh, there's a second stage in this process that we believe should be led by international and independent experts. Um, I'm just wondering there if the White House wants to bypass the World Health Organization on this, reading between the lines, don't know. They should have unfettered access to data. Again, implying that they haven't so far. And they should be able to ask questions of people who are on the ground. 
at this time and that's a step the World Health Organization could take. So it looks like they're going to give the World Health Organization a bit longer yet, seeing how they uh, respond. Now, um, this is interesting. Now, this I've given you that reference there just a bit back. So click on there. Make sure I'm interpreting this correctly. But so D Dr. Tedros is, uh, has been commenting and these are direct quotes from his statement. In my discussion with the team, they expressed the difficulties they encountered in uh, assessing raw data. So they were like given data by the Chinese, not the original raw data for them to process themselves. In other words, I mean, what's the difference between uh, information and data? So <coughs> data is kind of the raw numbers that you collect. Information is the sense that you make of that data. So it looks like they were saying they want the data at a, at a level where the data is much closer to the ground, not information. They just want the data. They're quite capable of analysing the data for themselves. Thank you very much. Um, I expect, this is Dr. Tedros again, I expect further collaborative studies to include more timely and comprehensive data sharing. Now, this is Dr. Tedros saying this. So um, he's saying he wants more timely and more comprehensive data sharing. In other words, he's saying so far, well, is it, I would think this is what he's saying. Don't want to put words in his mouth, but is he saying that it has so far it hasn't been timely? Is he saying that so far it hasn't been comprehensive? That, that would appear to be what he's saying. Scientists would benefit from full access to data, including biological samples from at least September 2019. Interesting, at least. So it looks like Dr. Chedros here wants biological samples like from August, September, October, November, December. And of course, the world is more than capable of analysing these biological samples for themselves and making their own conclusions. This is, this is what I mean. So what he's saying is we don't want the report on the biological samples. We want access to the biological samples. We want access to the raw data. So, so we can uh, analyze this for ourselves. The world's labs are quite capable of analyzing this biological material. I concur with the team's conclusions that farmers, suppliers, and their uh, contacts will need to be interviewed. So more interviews need to be conducted on the ground. Team also visited several laboratories in Wuhan and considered the possibility that the virus entered the human population as a result of a laboratory incident. So direct quote from uh, Dr. Tedros here. So um, you can see why I'm a little bit surprised by this apparent uh, change in tone uh, from Dr. Tedros. I see an apparent change in tone. However, I do not believe that this assessment was extensive enough. So he's saying that this could have come from a laboratory and that I do not believe that this assessment of the likelihood that it came from a laboratory was extensive enough. It needs to be more extensive. I think from memory, the team was in the Wuhan Institute for Virology for three hours. As far as we know, not doing experiments on the bench, just talking to people in, in the lab. Um, so Dr. Ted Ross unhappy with that. Further data and studies will be needed to reach a more robust conclusion. Right, and then he said this. Is he talking about the laboratory leak here? Well, who knows what he had in mind, but he said this is what he said. Let me say clearly that as far as the WHO is concerned, all hypotheses remain on the table. Although the team has uh, concluded that a laboratory leak is the least likely hypothesis, this requires further investigation potentially with additional missions involving specialist experts, which I am ready to deploy. So Dr. Tedros is saying here that at his disposal, he has uh, experts in uh, viral laboratory uh, techniques and he is happy to deploy them to China. Um, inter interesting, interesting. Uh, this report is a very important beginning. Fair enough. Um, but well, it's not fair enough. We'd hope for more, um, but 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 it's not the end. So Dr. Sedgwick was saying this is not the end of the matter. Uh, we have not yet found the source of the virus, and we must continue to follow the science 
and leave no stone unturned as we do so. So, well, we agree, continue to follow the science. We need to follow the science, we need to follow the evidence, but of course to do that we have to be, have full access to it. So really quite a significant change in flavour really, I, I perceive here from Dr Tedros, uh, and, and, and encouraging. Um, we need scientific answers to inform us about what happened and to inform us for the next pandemic. Uh, Peter Ban Embark, Danish, I believe, uh, one of the lead scientists on, on the mission. Uh, uh, possibly virus may have been circulating as early as November. Some cases may have been abroad. So not, is that an elaboration of what you said in the report, perhaps? Uh, areas where the, his team had difficulty getting down to the raw data in China. So we, even Peter's admitting they had difficulty getting down to the raw data. Data would need to be re-examined in the next phase of the probe. Okay, interesting. <coughs> raw data and then re-examine the data. And he says only scratching the surface of their understanding of the origins of the pandemic. So there you go. Um, look at it for yourself. Lots of graphs, lots of interesting uh, stuff in it. Surprisingly accessible. Um, you know, all the specialist uh, terminology is there. Um, it probably helps to have a bit of a scientific basis to background to understand it. But um, I would say the average, uh, the average intelligent lay reader would make quite a lot from this. So that's my interpretation. Um, I, if, if it turns out my interpretation's uh, wayward, I'll certainly correct that. But that's my interpretation at the moment. And uh, that's after quite a bit of <laughs> waiting through the report. OK, so that is us for today. So many other things to comment on. Um, increasing incidents in Europe. Europe really is heading in for continental Europe, unfortunately, really heading in for, for difficult times at the moment. And then, of course, there's the whole story about uh, vaccinations and things uh, still to discuss. But I thought that was quite important to, um, to prioritise that because, as I've said repeatedly, the next pandemic could be much more deadly than this and we need to learn how to truncate um, pandemic at the earliest possible stage. Okay, thank you, of course, for watching this video.